My guest tonight is a man who spent his life fighting against religious extremism. Raised as a fundamentalist in the American South, this retired bishop of the Episcopal or Anglican Church is one of the most fascinating men I have ever had the pleasure of meeting. I grew up an evangelical fundamentalist in the heart of the Bible Belt. According to my church, segregation was the will of God and they quoted the Bible to prove it. At the age of 12, John Shelby Spong started to walk away from the literal interpretation of the Bible he'd grown up with. While always holding his faith close, he began to question the fundamentals of his beliefs. I don't live in a world where virgins conceive and where people walk on water and where five loaves are distributed to feed 5,000 people. A lifetime clergyman, Jack Spong became one of the most progressive and controversial bishops in the United States, ordaining 35 gay members of his clergy. I'm not interested in being part of a church that is kept together in homophobic unity. Now 84, Bishop Spong is still fighting against those that use faith as a justification for fundamentalism. It's not a surprise that people today can quote the Bible to justify almost any act of terror or any prejudice that they wish to engage in. Bishop Jack, is it an oversimplification to suggest that extremism is the scourge of our time? Yeah, I th and I think religion adds to it enormously. Uh, there's something about organised religion that suggests that you have to have the whole truth so that anybody disagrees with your understanding of truth becomes the heretic that you want to purge and whenever any religion gets to the place where it says, I have the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, they always persecute one another. They always go into religious wars, and they always enter into religious prejudice. It's, uh, it's kind of a sad commentary on my profession. But so many extremists uh, began as, as young people who were fed one specific ideology, and you yourself at least can relate to that. Your, your upbringing was quite similar to that. I was raised in a very fundamentalist Anglican family. We sort of uh, said things like you'll hear in the Archdiocese of Sydney. Uh, we were sure we had the truth. We were sure the Bible was the absolute word of God. And, and we used it to build our security, but to tear down a lot of other people. I was taught when I was a child that segregation of the races was the will of God, and the Bible was quoted to prove it. I was taught that women were inferior by creation to men and the Bible was quoted to prove it. I was taught that it was okay to hate other religions and especially the Jews, and the Bible was quoted to prove it. And then I was taught that homosexuals are either mentally sick or morally depraved, and the Bible was quoted to prove it. I spent most of my life trying to overcome these. Usually when somebody has that kind of load of religious negativity put on them, when they break out of it, they cease to be religious at all. For reasons I don't fully understand, I was never able to do that. So I felt a compelling need to challenge the, the negativities that was in the Christian faith that I grew up in and that I treasure today. Well, in preparing for this interview, I, I downloaded a, a Bible app and, and, and tried to reacquaint myself with, with some of the scripture. And uh, I have to say that sometimes it, it sounds great and sometimes there are, there are baffling things that are said. There's um, from... Luke, uh, Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Yep. And I don't understand that. That sounds like he was having an off day. Yeah, well, he might have been. <laughs> Luke doesn't write. Most people think this is eyewitness reporting. Luke doesn't write until maybe the latter part of the ninth decade or the early part of the tenth decade. And by that time, Christianity has begun to break some families apart. That is, an individual, a, a husband or a wife or one of the children will move into the Christian tradition and then they, they find hostility and animosity. And so you have to make a decision whether Jesus or your family is going to be the primary value of your life. But if you quote the Bible literally, nobody would be alive today if we took the Bible literally. <laughs> now, the book of Leviticus says, if you have sex with your mother-in-law, you shall be put to death. I've never heard that preached on in my life. I think that's because most people can't imagine doing it. <laughs> so if, you, if, you, uh, if, you, if you can't imagine it, there's no reason to preach against it. Time does move on. Uh, you began fighting for the rights of the LGBT community 30 years ago. Did you rejoice in the recent Supreme Court decision? 
Uh, it's probably one of the happiest weeks of my life. We had that magnificent five to four decision by the court in favor of same-sex marriage, which means that nobody in America is now a second-class citizen. Uh, yes, I rejoiced in that enormously. You began fighting uh, for same-sex marriage in, in the 80s. How different was the debate then? Well, uh, I was thought of as pretty strange. Uh, uh, for, a, for a person who was a bishop of the church to be championing the rights of gay and lesbian people in our rather homophobic society was, was considered a rather radical and controversial thing. I've gotten 16 death threats in my life, and almost all of them came out of that debate because what happened in my life was that I was clearly homophobic, and I had several experiences with gay people that were transformative experiences for me. That is, they were life-giving people for me. They opened my eyes and my mind to see all sorts of things I hadn't seen before. And I suddenly realized that I couldn't possibly be an effective bishop and continue to be a prejudiced, homophobic person. So I decided I didn't know enough about sexual orientation. I called up a friend of mine who was a doctor at the Cornell Medical Center in New York City, and I asked him if he'd be willing to undertake the education of a bishop on issues of sexual orientation. Well, he had never had a bishop that wanted to be educated before. He'd never known a bishop that thought he needed to be educated before. And that was sort of thrilled this man, and so he decided he would do this, and he worked with me for about six months, and I read all the research papers they had at the medical school, and I came away with a lot of convictions that I had not seen before. One was that nobody chooses their sexual identity. I didn't choose to be heterosexual. I just woke up sometime when I was 12 or 13, and suddenly girls did not seem obnoxious to me any longer. And, <laughs> and I wanted to start combing my hair and dressing better uh, to attract female attention. I didn't, I didn't decide I'd be heterosexual. In fact, if somebody had said, you must be heterosexual, I wouldn't have known what they were talking about because I didn't know what that word meant. But I think we've got to get that right. Thank God, Pope Francis, by saying just one thing. He said, who am I to judge? That's all he said when somebody asked him about homosexual people. But that was a brand new note that he struck. And I think we've got to move away from judgment. Homosexuality is not something one chooses to do. It's something one is. It's interesting, though. Australia is now lagging behind the US. It's lagging behind Ireland. Uh, and our most senior Catholic, uh, Cardinal Pell, says things like this. I don't think uh, homosexual activity is uh, simply the result of genetic makeup because we are free. We can control our uh, instincts. And like uh, with heredity and environment, a lot of this practice is, uh, is learned. That's at odds with what you seem to have learned and with what the rest of the world seems to have learned. Yeah, that's also, if I may say so, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, but that's profoundly ignorant. And it is imperative that if Christian leaders are going to be in the debate, that they educate themselves on the subject. Uh, Bishop, Archbishop Pell, or Cardinal Pell, as he is now, has said things throughout his history that had just been embarrassing uh, because he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> I think it's a real tragedy that the church gets too many of its leaders on the wrong side of, of these great issues. If you look back at the history of the church, we supported slavery. We supported segregation. We supported, supported treating women as second-class citizens. We supported the divine right of kings. We supported persecuting left-handed people. We supported oppressing gay and lesbian people. And in every one of those instances, we did so out of cultural ignorance because we had not yet challenged the prejudices that, that had been handed down and it takes the secular society's knowledge to challenge those. And finally, the church, always late, finally comes on board. Bishop Jack, uh, just one more question before I let you go. Why are there no jokes in the Bible? Well, I think that <laughs> there are a lot of people that think there are a lot of jokes in the Bible. But, you know, I think church ought to be a joyful place. We ought to come and celebrate life. We ought to celebrate joy. We ought to celebrate love. We ought to celebrate forgiveness. That's what the Christian faith is all about. And it's a glorious and wonderful tradition. But we've smothered it with so much negativity and so much prejudice that it's terribly unappealing to a vast number of people in our world today, and particularly to the younger generations. Bishop John Shelby Spong, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure always to be with you, and I love all my friends in Australia. <laughs>